Genesis chapter 50, we're going to begin reading in verse 15. When you have it, say, I'm called. Okay, it reads like this. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. How many know his brothers try to kill him? It says, so they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin for they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of your father. And look at what Joseph did. The Bible says, and Joseph wept. Joseph wept. Tell me those leaders, we've got to learn to weep. He wept when his brothers told him. And then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and said, behold, we are your servants. Now, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am in the, am I in the place of God. He said, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In other words, God was building my character. In other words, God used it to make me to the man that I've become. Right? He says, in order to bring it about as it is this day, look at this, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. He says, I will what? I will provide for you and your little ones and he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them amen before you're seated sit, tell your neighbor there's a calling for the rest of us and you may be seated tonight what a great turnout i'm here you've been enjoying this haven't you well i, I gotta tell you i've really been enjoying teaching on the call of god because there's been such a strong stirring in our people and many people are rising up in their spirit and they're beginning to recognize that God wants to use their lives. And that's what we've been talking about on Wednesday night. But as I've been sharing with you every week, I've, I've learned some things in doing the ministry for over 25 years. And when we think of the calling of God, I, I want to share this with you tonight is that not every person will receive the, the call to quote unquote ministry in a traditional sense. Now, when you say the word ministry, you know, we think of, what do we think of? We think of preaching, right? But one thing I've, I've learned in doing ministry all these years is not every person will preach in the pulpit and not every person will sing or write music to move the masses. And not every person will leave and uproot their life to another land and not every person will spend their entire life leading and creating ministry ideas in the house of God. However, some will. In fact, many will. Many will answer the call to do that, even if it be just for a short time. But this is important for us to understand. Because I want you to know that there are no bench warmers in the kingdom of God. Come on, you can give God a big praise for that. There are no bench warmers in the kingdom of God. Tell your neighbor, you are not a bench warmer. Even if you never preached a sermon, even if you never stood up here to sing a song, I want to know you to know that there is still a divine purpose in your life. How do I know? How do I know that there's still a divine purpose in your life? I'll tell you, because you've, if you've ever had divine circumstances, Joseph said, Everything you tried to do to kill me was all for my good. Come on, somebody. It was all a part of God's plan. So how do I know there's a purpose for you? Because if you've ever been through hell or high water, I came to tell you it's because God has a divine purpose and a divine calling. Come on and shout to the Lord if you're getting a hold of this already. Elbow your neighbor and tell him you're called by God. Now, I read about Joseph because Joseph was chosen by God, but Joseph was not a preacher. He was chosen by God, but Joseph was not a preacher. Joseph had the ability and the gift to dream. And he also had the ability to interpret dreams, but there is no record of him ever preaching a sermon. Now, God didn't use Joseph to preach, 
But how many can agree with me tonight that he still used Joseph? He never preached a sermon, but Joseph was called by God to preserve the legacy of the people of Israel. If you could think of Joseph as anything, you could think of Joseph as a way maker. A way maker for his people in the most strategic time of need. And that's what I want you to understand about ministry, young people, third wave, second wave, first wave. I want you to understand this about ministry is that ministry is about people. I'll say it again. Ministry is about people. I'll say it one more time. Ministry is about people. And that's what the dream is all about. That's why his brothers threw him a pit, because at that young age, with that coat, that, that coat of many colors, Joseph made the mistake of thinking that the dreamer was about him. So he had to go to a pit and then a prison to figure out that the dream was never about him, but the dream was about people. Come on and give God a big praise. Come on, give God a big praise. Now, although it's not mentioned in Scripture, you, you never read about this in Scripture, having ministry experience, I want to tell you that it really is true in the church that there is what is called a class struggle in the church. And sometimes there's a struggle between those who work in full-time ministry and those who work full-time secular jobs. When we think about the calling of God, somehow some people who do not understand how the kingdom of God works thinks that some people are better than others. Somehow, and this happens in the church, that somehow they think that because you preach, you're better than the person who has a job. <laughs> and you know why I know that that's a flaw trait in the house of God? Because I've met two types of people in church. I've met full-time secular leaders who dream of doing full-time ministry. And I've met full-time ministers who dream of working full-time secular jobs and starting businesses. Come on, somebody. So I, I think we need to understand how the kingdom of God works. Is there should be no class struggle. There should be no, I'm better than you because I preach. Because you work a job, you're worse than me. I came to tell you that's a lie from the pits of hell. I came to tell you that everybody has a role. Everybody has a vision. Everybody has a purpose. What's the point? What's the point I'm trying to make to you? I'm trying to tell you that the kingdom of God and the, and the mission of God is built on people who know exactly what God has called them to be and know exactly what God has called them to do. What is my goal of this entire series on the call of God is I've got to get many of you to understand your specific calling. I've got to get many of you to understand that maybe you will never preach, maybe you'll never sing, but one day you'll build a business. One day you'll raise a godly family. Come on, somebody. Everybody's gift matters. Everybody's talent matters. Everybody's skill matters. Everybody's calling matters. Come on, so I don't care if you're 70 or 7. You matter in the house of the living God. Oh, come on and give God praise right now if you believe the way I believe. See, the kingdom of God is our people who, who, who understand it. And we can only be effective when we're functioning in our proper role. What is the calling of God? It's simply an invitation to join God in his cause. You say, I want to make it simple. What is the calling? It, it's simply an invitation by God to join him in his cause, not our own. To take every talent, to take every ability, to take every resource and begin to not use it for self, but to use it for his glory. That's what the calling of God is. And see, when it comes to building the kingdom, I want you to know this, and this is so key, that God never intended it to be either or. He never intended it to be either you do ministry or you work. I think I taught you a couple weeks ago that ministry is work. But let me flip it on you. Did you know work is also ministry? Come on now. Who's catching this right now? See, God didn't call you to do either or. I want you to understand, biblically, biblically God called us to do both. Touch your neighbor and tell him you've got to do both. Let me go a little bit deeper. He didn't just call you to do both. He anointed you to do both. Because when Jesus empowered his disciples, just like he's empowered us, he said, you will be my witnesses. 
Touch your neighbor and tell them you are a witness. The word witness in the Greek in the original language simply means that you are somebody that can vouch for my power. Mm, this is good right now. To be a witness is to be somebody who has experienced the evidence of God's power in their life. And to be a witness is to be somebody who says, I can vouch for healing. I can vouch for a restored marriage. I can vouch for financial blessing. I can vouch for God using me under the power of the Holy Ghost. I've experienced the power. And now that I have the power, watch this, I carry something. And not do I carry it just to stay in the four walls of the church. But I carry it to everywhere I go when I go to work. When I go to school, when I go to a family reunion, I carry the anointing because I can vouch for the power. How many know if you're going to be in ministry, you got to carry something? Touch your neighbor and tell me you've got to carry something. And I want you to know that when he calls you to be a witness and he calls you to do both, you need to understand there's no limit. When he calls us to reach the world, there's no limit to where we should go and there's no limit to how we should go. There's no limit. Someone's saying no limit. No limit. So I think this is important teaching tonight. How about you? Yes. Because for too long, the church has been trained that the spiritual and the secular are supposed to be separated. If that's the case, then why did Jesus move in the marketplace and not just in the temple? If that's the case, then why did Jesus heal the leper and heal the centurion's daughter? Why did Jesus not just go to the low places? Why did Jesus also go to the high places? I'm trying to teach you something here tonight. If Jesus, if, they, if Jesus thought we should only stay in the house and within the four walls, how many know that he didn't do that? He dined with sinners. He converted the leper, the Roman centurion. He healed the woman with the issue of blood, and he converted the tax collector, and he made the tax collector his disciple. Mary Magdalene was a woman of great means, and when she was delivered, she became one of Jesus' greatest financial supporters. Come on, somebody. So how many know we got to do both? Tonight, I want to talk to you about seven areas that people... Need to answer the calling. Seven strategic places God has called us to answer the call. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about these are seven areas where leadership is needed. Seven areas in, in, in society where, where leadership is needed. I, I like to call it the seven mountains of influence. Some of you might have heard this before. This is kingdom teaching. And, and this is teaching that God gave me years ago. These messages that I'm speaking to you, particularly this one, is a message God gave me over 11 years ago. When I was seeking God for the direction of our church, and I said, God, you know, what's going to happen when we reach all the drug addicts and we reach all the gang members and we reach all the guys coming out of prison, you know, then what? Because how many know a visionary leader is always thinking about what's next? And God began to show me he says, I'm able to take my people from the guttermost to the uttermost. I'm able to take my people from the low places to the high places. Come on, somebody. See, you got some people that were born high and live low. You got some people that are born low, but they learn to live high. And when you are a part of the ministry of Victory Arts, you may not come from a high life. You may not come from a background of finance. You may not come from a background of education. You may not come back, come out of some of those things. In fact, some of us came out of prison, came out of alcoholism, came out of a, a, a generational curses. But it doesn't matter if you've been born low. We serve a Jesus says, I can take you higher. I can take you from level to level. I Come on, somebody. I can do things that will blow your mind and blow your family's mind. If that's your testimony, I want you to give him a shout right now. I want you to praise him right now. See, there are seven areas where God has called us to be leaders. The first place is, the first mountain, the seven mountains of influence, number one is religion. The mountain of religion. Number two is family. Someone say family. family. That's the mountain of family. Number three is education. Say education. education. Mountain of education. Number four is business. Someone say business. The mountain of business. Media. Say media. That's the mountain of media. Also, arts and entertainment. Someone say A&E. &E. That's the arts and entertainment mountain. And then lastly is government. Right, the seven places 
that I believe that God can use Victor Outreach people. And the reason I think God can use Victor Outreach people in those places is because Victor Outreach people are grateful people. God-fearing people. We don't, we don't put our trust in self. We put our trust in God. Can I hear a good amen? So I'm going to go through a few of these tonight, and I, will, I probably won't finish. So take notes. Hold on to your notes. You can watch it on YouTube later. But the first mountain that God has called us to take leadership in, and I, and I believe as I share these things, some of your heart is going to be stirred. We've been talking about the call of God. Yep, yep, and some of your heart is going to be stirred. But the first mountain is the mountain of religion. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is the church. The mountain of religion is the church. This is the part we understand. This is the part we excel in. We understand that Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We get it. How many know we get it? Because we're constantly striving to raise leaders in the church, constantly striving to build bigger and better churches. I, I mean, people who come to church and, and they get upset because we're trying to get bigger and better don't understand the kingdom of God. Yeah. Don't wrestle with those people. Don't tussle with those people because understand the church has a mission. And what is that mission? Our mission is to multiply disciples and expand the vision all over the world. So when you think about religion mountain and the, the mountain of the church, you need to think of the church as being a beachhead in the city. Victor Outreach San Diego, we are a spiritual beachhead in this city. We are a strategic forward position. In order to win in war, you must be able to penetrate enemy lines and build a strategic forward position. So what did we go ahead and do? We went ahead and prayed. We went ahead and strategized. And we went ahead and planted right here in the hood. We don't want to be in the rich neighborhood. We want to be in the uppity up neighborhood. You say, send us to the ghetto. Send us to the highways and the hedges. Send us to the dark places. Because that's the anointing on Victory Outreach. Can anybody say amen? So what did we do? We went ahead and we built a church right here, right here in the hood. We planted. But the church here is a heavenly stronghold. Tell your neighbor, this is a heavenly stronghold. It's a place protected by angels. It's a place protected against the enemy. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's a place that's protected. Why? Because this is a place where disciples for the vision are being made. This is the place where ministers are being trained. This is the place where ministers are being restored. This is the place where families in ministry get to rest, get to get healed, and sent back out into the battlefield. Come on, somebody, say amen. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But you know that the church can lose its power. Satan can never penetrate the church, but the church can lose its power. You know, 90 Seven percent of the people are led by only three percent of the population. That means 97 percent of you that are here today are led by three percent of the people here in this church. The ministers, the ministers wives is just a small percentage of the people. And that's why Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest. Look at this to send out laborers into the harvest field. Amen. So why? Does the church become weak because the devil hits it? No. The church becomes weak because the people in the church don't rise up to answer the call. Ooh, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. He said, pray to me that I, leaders would begin to rise up. So what is that saying? Is that we need workers who will rise up. We need workers who will rise up. But I need you to understand and flash back to last week's message. We need workers who will rise up understanding that they cannot be effective without the fivefold ministry. We need leaders who weep. We need leaders who pray. We need leaders who preach with power. We need the apostolic gift. We need the prophetic gift. We need the evangelism gift. We need the pastoral gift. We need the teacher gift. Am I talking to the right people this morning? Because when those people begin to rise up, that's when the church starts to move at its full capacity. And we need the church to move at its full capacity. Why? Because the devil cannot penetrate the mountain of religion. But he can penetrate the other six mountains. He can penetrate 
the other six mountains. The other six mountains, I believe the church is religion, but the other six mountains are the gates that, tr that try to prevail against it. Cool, this is good. The, uh, the other six mountains are the gates. Say, neighbor, those are the gates. Those are the gates that try, try to prevail against the church. And why we need leadership at every gate? Why do we need leadership on every mountain? Because every one of those are the seven spirits that disciple a city. What would happen if we had godly leadership at the top of every one of those mountains? See, Satan desires to penetrate family, education, business, me is this too heavy for you guys? Media, arts and entertainment, and government. Because he knows that those gates can, if he can control those gates, he can control the discipleship of the city. And if he can control the discipleship of the city, then he can control the discipleship of the nation. And if he can control the discipleship of the nation, he can control the discipleship of the continent. I'm losing some of you, but is anybody with me here so far? And what's our goal? Woo! It's to convert those mountains. But where do those mountains need to flow into? Those mountains need to flow into the mountain we already have control of. They need to flow into the house of God. The family, the education, the government, the business. Come on, somebody. Now you're catching what I'm talking about here tonight. So we need leadership. Tell your neighbor, we need leadership. The second mountain I want to talk to you about is the mountain of family. We need leadership in the mountain of family. If you say you're called by God, then understand the value and the importance of family. Everybody say family. Acts chapter 16, verse 31 said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What am I saying to you tonight? Because I know I'm talking to the call. I want you to hear this, that God's plan is not just for the individual, but God's plan is a family plan. Godly families, look at this, produce positive change in the culture. Godly families produce Positive change in the culture. Ungodly families produce negativity in the culture. I think we should write that down. Godly families produce positive change in the culture. Positive change in the city. Ungodly families produce negativity in the culture. See, it's not just who's in the houses of government. It's who's leading your house. It's not just who's sitting in the White House. Who's in charge of your house? See, the nation of Israel survived persecution, survived war, survived almost totally being wiped out in World War II and constant opposition to their people. Why? Because they took the discipleship of the family seriously. From the very beginning, the Lord told them to write the law and place it on the doorposts to tie it around the wrist and put it on their forehead and to put it on their gates because they needed to set the standard in the family. Look how quiet it is in here tonight. But I know there's some young people here tonight that you, you want to see the curse broken. And you're thinking about who you're going to marry and who you're going to have kids with. Come on, somebody. Well, I hope you make the right choice because Israel knew how to take the discipleship of the family serious because they understood that strong believers plus strong marriages equals strong families, which equals strong legacy. Listen to this tonight. In a book entitled Evicting Demonic Squatters and Breaking Bondages. Go buy that at Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> Evicting Demonic Squatters and Breaking Bondages. The author tells about two families that were studied over a 200-year history. Max Jukes was an atheistic, non-believing father, while Jonathan Edwards was a committed Christian leader and a revivalist. Listen to this. Max Jukes married an atheist woman, had 560 descendants. This is over 200 years. Married an ungodly woman, had 560 descendants. 300 of, and 10 of them died poor paupers. One, not pop lockers, poppers, poor, beggars. <laughs> 150 of 
Those descendants were criminals. Seven of them were murderers. One hundred were drunkards. One half of the women in his bloodline were prostitutes. And it cost the U.S. government $1.25 in the 19th century dollar. Jonathan Edwards married a godly woman. And he had double the descendants. He had 1,394 descendants. 295 graduated college. 13 college presidents. 65 professors. Three U.S. senators. Three state governors. 30 judges. 100 lawyers, 56 doctors, 75 military officers, 100 missionaries, preachers, and authors. 80 held public office. Three of them were mayors, and one was a U.S. controller of the U.S. Treasury. How many know we got to take our family serious? Come on, how many know we got to raise our family into things of God? How many know we got to make the right choice? Come on and give God a big, big praise. Who really caught that in their spirit tonight? See, God wants to raise up leaders. He wants to raise up the call to occupy these territories, not just the church, but to get out of the church, to, to guard the family. What about education? In Proverbs 129, turn there with me tonight. Am I teaching okay? Yes. Proverbs 129. In verse 129 through 33, it says this. It says, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none in my counsel. And they despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. Look at this. For the turning away of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without the fear of evil. Some would say education. Sometimes we overlook education. We look to religion, we look to family, but we don't think about the effects of education over our families, over our children, over the next generation. June 25th, 1962, prayer was removed from the schools. And before that time, every student was required to do two things before class, say the Pledge of Allegiance and pray. What was the result? The result of having prayer removed from the schools is that the word of God was removed from the schools. In just a short time, in just 10 years, in 1972, Roe v. Wade was legalized in the U.S. Supreme Court. And since that time, listen to this, there have been well over 54 million abortions in the United States. 54 million abortions. Where was the church? Where were the pastors? Where were the leaders? Where were the godly parents? Oh, man, it's quiet in here today. I, I think you're going to get stirred up tonight. We're talking about the call of God. Come on, somebody. We're talking about changing the culture, impacting the city. 54 million abortions in the United States to this date. Children who had gifts, children who had talents, children who had ability to do good. Kids who could have cured cancer. Kids who had creative ideas to improve the lives of people. Preachers, teachers, prophets, evangelists. Pastors all wiped out because the church didn't wake up at the right time. And if anything, I think there's some of you right now, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. You need to wake up to understand this thing's bigger than you. It's not about your time to preach and your five minutes of fire and the song you wrote when you were in prayer. You need to come out of that right now. You need to understand that lives are literally on the line. And we need some people that are going to weep for the condition of the church, weep for the condition of the family, weep for the condition of our educational system. Am I in the right place here tonight? Is there anyone here that if you are truly called, you're not just going to care about your personal calling, but you recognize the calling of God is about people, it's about history, it's about legacy, it's about change. 
we can bring change. Maybe you're not called to be a preacher, but you're called to be a, a school teacher. Maybe you're not called to be an evangelist, but God has called you to tutor young people in school and to help them get a hold of God's plan in their life. I don't know what it is, but I think some of you guys start thinking out of the box, start thinking bigger, start understanding that God can use you outside the four walls of this building because we are called not just to start a church. We're called to change a city. We're called to change a nation. We're called to change the world. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. We're still talking about the call of God. Are you with me? What's the fourth mountain? I'm going to end with this one. I'll do the other ones later. Business. Someone say business. There's this whole conception that one calling is better than the other. When Jesus says, I've called you to do both. In fact, the very... One of the very first promises, one of the very first commandments the Lord gave the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. He says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to attain wealth. That he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Now, you got some people that they're always worried about money. Some of you are here this morning. Oh, they're going to talk about money. Let me tell you something. Money has no spirit. It takes on the spirit of the person holding it. It has no spirit. It's just a piece of paper. But it takes on the spirit of the person who possesses it. And the question is, you can use your money for evil or you can use your money for good. I don't care if someone gives me a hundred bucks that came from a drug dealer. In the hand of a drug dealer, he was killing people. But in my hand, I'm building people. Because money has no spirit and the Lord says, I'm going to store up the riches of the ungodly and I'm going to give them over to the godly. Come on, somebody. And I don't know about you, but God has not just raised us up to give a testimony. He wants to bless us. He wants to increase us financially. I guess I came to tell you on this night that if you're called, you have to get blessed. You have to walk in a spirit of prosperity. You have to do God's business and you have to do what God has called you to do. And you have to believe God for an open window blessing because it is God's plan to bless you. Money has no spirit. It takes on the spirit of the person who holds it. That's why we're seeing a stirring in the business leaders of our church. We're seeing a spark. We started our business leaders ministry not too long ago and there's already a spark. There's an excitement. Why? Because... Whenever someone begins to understand their purpose, it produces fire in their life. When you begin to really understand your gift and understand your place in the kingdom of God and understand how your gift produces for the overall vision, you can't help but to get excited about it. The ones who are not excited are the people that don't understand. Some simply don't even understand that they even have a gift. I came to tell you, none of us is empty handed. Every single one of us has a gift. Every single one of us has a talent. Every single one of us has an ability to help God do what God wants to do. All you got to do is figure it out. All you got to do is find it. All you got to do is grow it, develop it, build it, and contribute. But when somebody begins to discover their purpose, who's discovered their purpose tonight? There's a fire that is sparked inside of them. We're seeing that happen in our business leaders because our business leaders are starting to discover that the Bible is the greatest business book ever written. The Bible. Someone say the Bible. Listen to me. It's all in the Bible. You know why the Bible is one of the greatest business books ever written? Because the Bible deals with the condition of men and women's hearts. (laughs) It deals with the spirit of greed and pride and selfish ambition. All these things that try to derail the call, that try to take the call out of the place God wants them to be. Open up your Bible and God will set you straight real quick. Can I hear a good amen? And it's not only the reading of the word, but it's the preaching of the word. We have to preach the word with power, especially when it comes to business. I tell you, if you teach business people to look to the Bible, 
great things can happen. Some of you have heard of Geneva, Switzerland. Some of you have heard that Switzerland is one of the most prosperous nations in the world. It's where the world puts their money. Governments put their money. Banks put their money. You ever ask yourself why? Why does everybody put their money in Switzerland? Well, it's because Switzerland was a country that used to be stuck in poverty. It was one of the poorest countries in the world in the 1500s. Abject poverty for the people. Businesses and banks could not flourish until two preachers came along. <laughs> one by the name of Martin Luther and the other by the name of John Calvin. And you know what they did? They said, God wants to take this country out of poverty. The Bible promises prosperity, that the people of God should be blessed. There was revival happening in the spirit, but not in the money. And what they did is they began to preach the word of God, the greatest business book ever written to the leaders of the banks. And they told the leaders of the banks, you know why your bank doesn't prosper? It's because you charge too much interest on the people. The interest is too high for anybody to get a return. You can't get enough people wanting to borrow from you, and you can't get enough money into the people who are borrowing. It's a failed business model. So as they preach the word of God and they preach integrity, Ooh. integrity with their finances and, and dealt with the hearts of greedy people and dealt with the hearts of greedy bank owners, they convinced the banks, watch this, to develop what's called the 4% interest rate. Anyone in this church who owns a house at 4% will tell you right now, that's an amazing interest rate. Right. Come on, somebody. Who knows what I'm talking about? The first house I ever bought was on a 4% interest rate, and I was happy as 10 clowns. <laughs> that just told me that the bank was making enough money to give me the loan, but it had me in a financial position, not only to pay my mortgage, but to have money left over for my family. And when these two preachers rose up in Switzerland and they taught these banks how to deal with their heart and they lowered the interest rates, today, 400 years later, Switzerland is one of the richest nations in the entire world. Don't tell me that God's not interested in growing business. Come on, give God a praise. Don't tell me that God doesn't want his people to be blessed. Come on and give God a praise. Well, what would happen if some of you were so blessed what would happen if some of your businesses were so blessed? What would happen if some of you who have been working in industry, working in business, working in these areas in the city were so blessed that you took those finances and you said, it is my entire calling to resource the vision of God. It is my entire purpose. God has been so good to me financially and we're not going to have to struggle to raise money to go to Ohio. We're not going to have to struggle to raise money to go to Panama. We're not going to have to struggle to raise money to push this wall back. Come on, somebody. In fact, if another building comes, God has been so good to me financially. I, he has given me the ability to attain wealth. We can begin to change this city, change this country, change this world for the glory. And you know what makes it more powerful? They said nothing good could come out of the hood. Nothing good could come out of Logan. Nothing good could come out of Shelltown. But look what the Lord has done today. We put our trust in the word of God. Oh, come on and give God a big, big praise right now. Come on and give him a big, big praise. I'm preaching better than you shout. So how many know that we have a purpose? Tell your neighbor, we have a big purpose. Whew, I'll tell you right now, hear me and hear me clear. Some of you will never preach. Some of you will never sing. Some of you will never run a men's home. Oh, but you'll build a business for God. Oh, come on. Some of you may never spend years in the mission field. Oh, but your family is going to serve the Lord and your legacy is going to be strong. Come on, you may not see it in your lifetime, but you're going to see it in your bloodline. I'll say it again. You may not see it in your lifetime, but you're going to see it in your blood time. But your bloodline is going to run through your DNA. 
Someone say, I'm called. So we've got to watch this as I close. I'm going to go a little bit more. Is that all right? We've got to work like we're called. Touch your neighbor, tell them, work like you're called. Tell your other neighbor your second choice. Work like you're called. Write this down, the eight works of the call of God. Number one, we work to meet human needs. Someone say we work. We work to meet human needs. We work to make a positive impact on people. Ministries about people. Number two, we view our work as ministry. Put your hand in your heart say my work is ministry. Look at this, whatever we do. Whether you paint houses, whether you fix plumbing, whether you sell houses, whether you sell cars. Oh, car salesman, I hope the Lord deals with your heart. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whatever you may, look at, listen to this. Listen to how strong this is. It's not about making money. It's about helping people. Yeah. Come on, clap if you believe that's how we got to operate. We, we, Victor Outreach has got to operate like that. Number three, we view our work as worship. Well, this is good. Our whole life is a beautiful fragrance to the Lord. Every sermon we preach, every task we do, every business deal we make, every time we talk to our children, talk to our spouse, it's worship to the Lord. We don't do it to man. Come on, we do it to God. We don't do it unto man. Come on, catch it. Clap the clap with me. We don't we don't do it unto man. We do it unto the Lord. It's worship. Lord, I'm preaching this message, but this is worship. I'm singing this song, but this is worship. I'm changing my baby's diapers, but this is worship. I, I'm driving this truck, but this is worship. I want my life to be a fragrance. I'm gonna do it with joy. I'm gonna do it with passion. I'm not gonna complain. I want my life to be a sweet fragrance to you. Number four. We use our work as a platform to share Christ. This is my platform. Some of you will stand on this platform, but wherever you go, God's given you a platform. You might work as a nurse. What a wonderful platform. What, what a wonderful platform, man. Nurse, I, I love nurses more than doctors. I do. You a nurse? Yeah, you're on your way. You're still, you're that. We got a lot of nurses in our church. A lot of nurses. A lot of people working. It's a wonderful platform. Your work is a platform. You might drive a UPS truck. It's a platform. You know, whatever you do, it's a platform to share the love of God. What do, what do we do with that platform? We're building relationships. We're built, tell your neighbor, we got to build relationships. How are we going to grow the beachhead? Is it by shouting at people, yelling at people? No, no. Just giving people a flyer and running? No, no, no. Building relationships. Taking our platform at work and sharing the love of Jesus and building relationships. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Number five, we work. Those that are called work, we, we earn money to fund God's work. That's it. Because for most of us, work will be our primary means of ministry. For most of us. You know, I believe many are called. And, and, and I believe some of you will rise up. I do. I mean, don't let me crush your dream now because I'm not the one that called you. God did. So don't worry about what I say. I'm just teaching. Can I just teach my church? Now, I know some of you will rise up. But there is a majority of you that, that, that work will be your primary ministry. And how many know now you know you realize that doesn't make you a second-class citizen in the house of God. But as God begins to prosper you, and God begins to bless you financially, and God not only begins to meet your needs, but then God starts giving you a little bit of your wants. He's going to speak to you. And he's going to say, I want you to channel those funds to Africa. I want you to channel those funds to the next project the church is getting involved in. I want you to channel those funds to United We Can. I want you to channel those funds to, to, to the work of the ministry because you know what? Work is your ministry. I mean, no, that's powerful. And you know what I believe is the more you sow, 
God always gives to who he can give through. He says, I'm not worried about the gift. Paul says, I'm worried about the seed that you're going to receive once you get it. Because whenever you let go of your seed, God just gives you more seed. How many have been getting more seed in this season? I've been getting all kinds of seed. Thank you, Jesus. Number six, look at this. We work to care for the less fortunate. That's something we've been envisioning our business leaders in our Bible study. We want to build businesses so that the guys and girls coming out of our home will have a place for training. How many love our homes? Love our homes. Love our homes. That's what we're praying. We're praying that if they do well and they say, I really want to serve the Lord, we'll have a place to train them because we care for those that need to get back on their feet. See, biblically, we have to do it. In fact, Boaz plowed his field in a circle because he left the corners growing for people who needed to glean from the field who were less fortunate. That's why when Ruth went to Boaz's field, she knew that there would be something for her to glean from in her time of need. And leaders, business leaders, ministry leaders, don't eat everything. Don't eat everything. Leave something for the less fortunate. Leave le something for the prisoner. Leave something for the guy coming out of the neighborhood. Leave something for that young person that comes to church but their family don't come. Come on, somebody. Leave something for the, those that have need. Come on, how many are with me on that? We, we got to plow our, plow our field in a circle and not eat everything. We got to leave something growing for the less fortunate. That's how we work. Tell your neighbor, that's how we work. Number seven, we work. Look at this to transform our culture. We want to transform everything. We want to transform everything. Tell you, but we want to transform everything. We're not just changing this building, we're changing lives. And we're not just changing lives, we're changing these streets. That's why you need to be there on Saturday. Who's gonna be there on Saturday with the mayor? See the doors God's opening because he's saying there's a church that doesn't just care about themselves, but they're out to change the culture. And we want to change this whole area for the glory of God. That's the last thing. That's the last thing. Did you get something tonight? Can you encourage me a little bit? This was a tough one for me. But can you encourage your pastor a little bit? I really wanted to give you... I'm trying to give you the best. Is that okay? I'm trying to really give you guys some stuff that's going to take. Who feels like they're going to another level? Who feels like they're growing? Who says, I'm understanding the call of God like never before? Who's understanding the call of God? Who says, I get it now, Pastor. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. What, what's the last one here? We work, and this is the most important thing, to bring glory to the Father. How many know he gets all the glory? He gets all the glory. Can we just give him glory right now? Yes, Jesus, you get all the glory. I think we should thank him. Thank him for giving you back your mind and giving you back your heart. Come on, thank him for your spouse. Thank him for your children. We, we work so that God can get all the glory. We say, God, no matter what we do, we give you the glory. No matter what we do, we give you the glory, God. We, we work for you. We work for the kingdom. We work to advance your plan. I think a lot of us should right now just begin to open up our mouth. And, and don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. Business leaders, come on, help me. I, you've been learning. I want my business team. Help me pray right now. I want my business leaders, my committee, help me right now. Come on, let's pray for the people right now. Lord, we give you praise. We give you praise. Yes, we may not be where we want to be, but God, we are not where we used to be. And we know it's only because of you. It's only because of you that I'm in this place of blessing. It's only because of you that you brought me into a spacious place. I was once in a cave, but you brought me into a spacious place. You brought me into a place of abundance. You, you brought me into a place of increase. You brought me into a place of unique calling and gifting and talent. People didn't want anything to do with me, but look how far you brought me, God. And we give you the glory, and we give you the praise, and we give you the honor. Come on, give him praise and give him honor tonight. Come on, give him praise and give him honor tonight. If you're called by God, give him praise and say, yes, God, I'm grateful. Yes, I'm grateful, God. I couldn't even speak. I couldn't talk in front of people, but Lord, look what you have done in my life. You gave me a voice. You gave me a mouth to speak. You gave me a heart to feel. God, I thank you. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many want to give him praise right now? Come on, how many want to give him praise? We, he made a way. We thank God for that. But how many know we should give God praise for all he's done and all he's about to do? All he's about to do. I need a song that will stir up the praise of God's people. I need a song that's going to cause us to want to give him glory and give him praise and give him honor. I need a song that we're going to be able to lift up our hands and lift up our voice. And see, we're doing training right now. We need a song that, that's going to take us into a place of gratefulness and a place of Thank you. 